Remember the information that highlighted Jehovah as the merciful judge of all the earth? We were thrilled to learn that individuals who died in the flood of Noah's day, in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and even some who might repent during the great tribulation, could benefit from Jehovah's mercy. Since hearing that information, have you found yourself thinking a lot about Jehovah's mercy? Well, so has the governing body. In our prayerful study, meditation, and discussions, we've focused our attention on how Jehovah has dealt with people who engaged in serious sin. In this update, we'll briefly consider the pattern Jehovah set in the Bible record. Then we'll discuss some new information regarding the way we'll handle cases of wrongdoing in the Christian congregation. So the changes we are about to hear are either the result of divine revelation, or they are motivated by a desire to protect the assets of the Watchtower Corporation. We know that governments are clamping down on religions which do not hold to international standards on human rights, like the Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. If you are inclined to think that this is divine revelation, the leading of the Holy Spirit, then consider this. Mark Sanderson and his fellow GB members claim to belong to a group of men who make up the faithful and discreet slave, which they believe Jesus appointed in 1919. They also claim to be the channel by which Jehovah God communicates with his people today. That means for the past 105 years, again according to their claim, they have been directed by Holy Spirit from Jehovah God to feed the flock Bible truth. Got it? And with all that study, and all that time, and all that guidance from God's Holy Spirit, these men are only now figuring out some, how did he put it, new information on handling wrongdoing in the Christian congregation? This information isn't new. It was written down for the world to read some 2,000 years ago. Nor is it hidden, sealed way away for a few to decipher. I figured it out. No, I'm not bragging. That's the point. I and many others like me were able to understand how to deal with wrongdoing in the congregation by simply reading the Bible, free from any doctrinal or religious bias. Just pray for Holy Spirit, clear your mind of preconceptions and the interpretations of men, and let the Word of God speak for itself. It doesn't even take that long certainly not 105 years. I'm not going to subject you to the entirety of Mark Sanderson's talk. He next goes on to give the examples of God's mercy toward those who are sinning. Mark makes it clear that our Heavenly Father desires all to repent. But what does the Bible mean when it speaks of repenting? It doesn't mean only to stop saying. Repenting means openly confessing one's sins making heartfelt acknowledgement that one has sinned, and part of that is apologizing and asking the one whom you've sinned against to forgive you. Mark is about to confirm what we've all been saying for some time now, that they've been harming people, causing great psychological hurt, often suicide, by the implementation of a shunning policy that is unscriptural. It's not enough to change that. They've sinned and need to apologize, to ask for forgiveness. If they do not, then they are not going to be forgiven, neither by men nor by Jesus Christ, the judge of all humankind. Spoiler alert, you're not going to hear any apology. Ah, but then you knew that already, didn't you? Be honest, you knew. The governing body has prayerfully considered how Jehovah's mercy could be better reflected when dealing with wrongdoers in the congregation. And that's led to a clearer understanding of three scriptures. Let's consider the first. So after getting it wrong for decades, the governing body has decided to pray for guidance. And as a result, they've come to see that three scriptures have been misapplied by them to the harm of thousands. The first is 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26, which reads, Instructing with mildness those 
not favorably disposed, perhaps God may give them repentance, leading to an accurate knowledge of truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, seeing that they have been caught alive by him to do his will. Here's how they are now going to apply that passage of Scripture. How does a clearer understanding of 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 adjust our current arrangement? Presently, a committee of elders normally meets with a wrongdoer only one time. However, the governing body has decided that the committee may decide to meet with the person more than once. Why? At Revelation 2, 21, Regarding that woman Jezebel, Jesus said, I gave her time to repent. We hope that through the loving efforts of the elders, Jehovah will help a wayward Christian to come back to his proper senses and repent. How nice. His words are dripping with honey. Loving elders working hard to restore the sinner to repentance. Before, they only met with the sinner one time. Their goal was to establish two things. One, had a sin been committed, and two, was the sinner repentant. As an elder for 40 years, I knew that we were discouraged from meeting with the sinner more than once. I remember doing so and being chastised by the circuit or seer for it, because the goal was only to ter- determine if they had sinned and were repentant all on their own. If the sinner appealed, perhaps repenting for his sin after the committee decided to disfellowship, the appeal committee was not allowed to consider his repentance. The appeal committee had only two goals. One, determine that there was in fact a sin, and two, determine whether or not the sinner was repentant at the time of the initial committee meeting. It didn't matter that the disfellowship person might be exhibiting heartfelt repentance at the time of the appeal hearing. All the appeal committee was allowed to go on was whether there was repentance at the initial hearing. And just how on God's green earth were they going to determine that since they were not present at that hearing? They had to rely on the testimony of witnesses. Right. One against three. Three elders saying the sinner wasn't repentant, the sinner saying he was. It's the very definition of a kangaroo court a totally unscriptural way of dealing lovingly with a fellow Christian. Now suddenly the governing body is talking about lovingly striving to restore the sinner to repentance. This they have realized through prayerful meditation. Give me a break. What was their prayerful meditation for the last 60 years? Oh, and they are only now realizing the significance of Jesus' forbearance concerning the woman Jezebel? in the congregation of Thyatira? Some Bible scholarship they are exhibiting. What about baptized minors, those under 18 years of age, who engage in serious wrongdoing? Under our current arrangement, such a baptized minor, along with his Christian parents, must meet with a committee of elders. Under our new arrangement, two elders will meet with the minor and his Christian parents. Reportedly, dealing with baptized minors is very troublesome for them. The problem they face is that a minor getting baptized is not informed of the ramifications of baptism. He or she does not realize that should they choose to leave the religion a few years later, they will be shunned by family and friends, even their parents. There is no informed consent. This is a serious legal matter and a violation of human rights. These changes, I believe, are just the first steps the organization must take to protect its assets from further losses. They cannot afford to lose their charitable status in one country after another. So, there will likely be new light down the road further clarifying how minors are to be treated. 